Good morning and welcome to Wadi Christian Church. <laughs> well, let us go to God in prayer. I'll give us time to pray silently and then I'll close us in a community prayer. Let us pray. to you this day. Be with us as we gather together, as we grow in our understanding, and we move in your will and in your way. In your holy name, O oh God, we pray. Amen. Okay. If you were here last week, the scripture will look very familiar to you. Very familiar to you. So we're in Matthew chapter 5. Starting at verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a boat. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds, and praise your Father in heaven. So last week, I kind of did this backwards in some ways, right? Last week, we, we looked at the you are the light of the world piece. This week, we're looking at the you are the salt of the earth piece. Uh, we could say that I picked the light of the world piece last week because so many of us were dealing with power outages and storms that we needed to know about the light. And that this week we're talking about salt because we got a fellowship meal. Um, but really, it just kind of the way it worked. So we're going to look at that salt piece today, uh, which some of you will be very excited about, uh, more so than others. Jesus described his followers as salt of the earth. Part of a sermon that he's giving to his disciples, his closest followers. He says to them, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? Let's think about that. It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Those words follow the Beatitudes, the good things about the blessings that he promises. And they are interpreted as referring to Jesus' expectations for his disciples, what he expects of us who follow him. Now, we have to remember, in those days, salt was very, very valuable commodity. Salt was valuable for two reasons, uh, pres uh, preservative for food, and to, of course, enhance the flavor of food, right? We all know how essential salt is in enhancing taste of food. Uh, on some of the most popular foods, salt is what brings out the right flavor of it, right? Uh, in 1853, George Crumb, who was a chef in New York, accidentally invented one of our most beloved dishes. Uh, he, there was an item on the actual menu for fried potatoes, which you, you all know. And the more he tried to fry them, the more this particular customer complained. They're soggy. You need to fry them more. You need to do more. You need to do more. Well, he finally got tired of this particular customer, so he sliced the potatoes as thin as possible, burned the mess out of them in the fryer, and then... I mean, just drown them in salt. The customer was satisfied, and thus the potato chip was born. What would a potato chip taste like without any salt? Terrible is right. Or french fries with no salt? Popcorn? Now, obviously, we can overindulge in salt. All right, there, there are two people pointing at you, and I just, I mean, just instinctively went in that direction. <laughs> but few people, I mean, voluntarily choose to have a salt-free diet. It's not really what people do in general. When Christ said that we are the salt of the earth, perhaps he's saying that we should bring flavor to life, like he brought flavor to life. There's a story about a 
uh, a woman named Marge. And Marge writes a columnist. You know, you've got those, you know, Dear Abby, Ann Landers, advice columns. So she writes to this columnist and she begins her story like this. She says, my name is Marge. And I'm 44 and I'm married to a wonderful man. And we have really, we get along great. There's no drinking, there's no gambling, there's no cheating. Our home is paid for, our children are healthy and normal. Everybody is doing well. So why am I writing you, she says. Because my life is blah. It's missing something. It's like stew without salt. I feel a certain emptiness. I wonder if any of us can identify those very feelings. Many people in our society have this emptiness in their lives. Like this woman, their lives are blah. Something is missing. Something's not quite there. They are like stew without salt. I can attest that it's not a good taste to it. So how do we bring flavor to people's lives? I think one piece that we need to remember is that we bring flavor to people's lives when we show them genuinely concern for them. When we let them know that somebody, somebody cares about them. There's a story that went around not that long ago. Um, there was a small town who had a 5K race. You know, we do that sometimes on Wadi Day and those kinds of things. And, and in the race was a nine-year-old little boy named Boat. And Bowden was all excited about this race, and he starts off like most of the young people in 5K races or any kind of race where he's running full steam ahead. No idea how long 5K is going to be. He gets about, I don't know, not very far up, but it hits him. And he, I mean, just the steam, you can just watch him get slower and slower and slower and slower. And he's struggling to make it, you know, one step in front of the next. And he's used everything he has, and it's very early on. Well, also in the race is this 19-year-old Marine, Lance Corporal Miles Kerr. And he notices that this boy who was running in front of him is, is very quickly losing steam. So he begins to think about how he can encourage this little boy. So he slows down. Come on, you've got this. Don't give up. Just keep moving. All you got to do is keep moving forward. You don't have to run fast. You just got to keep going. Don't stop. Don't stop. Don't stop. Now, he didn't know this little boy. Never met this little boy in his life. There was nothing life or death about this particular race. But something stuck in that Marine's mind. Perhaps it was that Marine idea that no man is left behind. And he didn't want this little boy to be left behind. Whatever it was, he encouraged that boy all the way to the finish line. It was so important to him. He reflected great credit upon himself. And he kept the highest traditions of the Marine Corps going. I would like to think that followers of Jesus Christ would be as kind and as helpful as anyone who was struggling as that Marine was. Anytime we show genuine concern for someone else, we are making the world a better place. We are adding flavor to their lives. We are showing ourselves to be salt of the earth. That's the first thing that salt does. Salt brings flavor to food. Traditionally, however, salt has played an even more important role in the lives of human beings. For many generations, it was the only real preservative humanity had for food. Indeed, before the modern miracle of refrigeration, people were quite limited in the foods they could enjoy because they were limited in how they could preserve the food, especially meat for later use. In the warmest weather, meat in particular would decay rapidly, so salt was the only ingredient that could slow that process down. African natives would cut beef and lamb and wild game meat into slender strips, soak it in salt solution, and hang it out to dry in the hot sun. Uh, it would effectively become what we in North America know as jerky, right? That's where jerky comes from. It made for a light but nourishing meal for the community that had a long shelf life. Salt both, salt both preserved the food in the intense heat and offered great strength when it was consumed. So it's got a lot going on for it. I don't think we give it enough credit anymore. You are the salt of the earth. In the ancient world, salt was a valuable commodity. Workers were paid with salt. An interesting footnote, the word salary starts with the, the root word salt. Yeah, okay. I thought that was interesting. I don't know. i got to give you a little bit of my homework. 
Persons wanting to buy something in the ancient world would pay for it with salt, in the same way that we use money today. People would treasure salt as we might value gold or silver. Um, salt was so valuable that soldiers in the Roman Empire received an allowance of salt as part of their pay. In various eras, <coughs> you, um, in various eras, uh, people in Ethiopia and other parts of Africa have used cakes of salt to pay their debts. So that's something that even continues to this day. It's kind of interesting. Uh, in the Civil War, General Sir Sherman of the Union Army charged one of his captains with aiding the enemy because he let them acquire salt. He said salt is imminently contraband um, because of its use in curing meats and without which armies cannot uh, subsist. So it was so important that he even tried to keep it from getting um, to the southern states. Just, I think that's fascinating how important those kinds of things become. We simply cannot emphasize enough how important salt was to earlier societies, including our own. The question is though, how do we, as followers of Christ, serve as a preservative in our time, in this time? Here's one answer, just to think about this. Are we not those who have been entrusted with the task of preserving for future generations the good news of Jesus Christ? Is that not something we've been called to do? Isn't that the essential task of people of Christ? To be a witness to his presence in the world? So this week, they had, you know they sometimes they do like these um, rewind things where they show like commercials of, of the past kind of thing? So I think they're fascinating. So I like to watch some of those when they come on. The YouTube does them every so often. Anyway, this particular one came on, and I've seen this, but it's been years ago. It's an old MasterCard commercial with a golfer. So if you're a golfer, you probably can appreciate this. But it comes on, and it's got the, the two golfers and, the, and the, on a certain golf course, and it's got the voiceover that accompanies the efforts, you know. Uh, green fees, $116. Uh, graphite shaft clubs, $877. Lunch at the turn, $13.50. Balls and tees, $36. And then the clincher, of course, that one miraculous thing where he hits the ball, gets a hole in one, and he's got a witness. A hole in one and a witness, priceless. <laughs> Right? For everything else the money can buy for those other things, MasterCard, right? Uh, if we ever hit a hole in one, and I, I've never even tried, but I can imagine, uh, you want a witness there, and nobody's going to believe you, right? That's kind of one of those things. What Jesus wants are witnesses people who will witness to this generation that Christ is alive and at work in the world. People who will testify to the difference his presence has made in their lives. People who, because of their credibility, will make it possible to preserve the teachings of Christ for later generations. We each need to ask the question whether our lives would convince people that Christ is alive by the difference that he has made in our lives. Are we a witness for our Lord? I was reading a story uh, from one of my colleagues in ministry. His name is jo Jeffrey Collins. Jeffrey Collins um, started a, a community outreach program. He calls Love in Action. Great name. Um, and he was working specifically with different groups than, in that, with illness. So he was working a lot with hospice, a lot with local communities where they kind of fit in, the, in between places, you know, where they're not sick enough for hospice, but they're too sick for other organizations. So he was working with them, um, I mean, right down, hands and feet, helping, you know, in their homes, doing things like that. Um, but he, he told this story uh, to the group that we were gathered together. He was talking about how, you know, you have these weeks where you're helping people 60, 70, 80 hours in the week. And you get to a Friday night and you're finally going to just have the night off. And you just have this complete exhaustion. There's something called compassion fatigue. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Where you've just helped and you've helped and you've helped and you've helped. And you just need to kind of tune it out for just enough time to bring some life back into your own life, so to speak. So he's having one of those moments where he was, you know, he's at dinner, he was with friends, and he was very, you know, just wore out. And right about the time, they're getting ready to order his phone rings. So he pulls it out and he looks and it's one of his clients. And he thinks about, do I answer, do I not answer, do I answer? Ah, I've got to answer, you know, there's nobody else. 
you know, I've, I've committed to do this, there's nobody else. So he answers, and it's this guy named Jimmy, and Jimmy is, is, is almost in tears. He says, Jeff, I'm so sorry, but I've got a fever, and I need help. So Jeff says, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm on my way. And he said, I'm so angry. He said, I know it's not the rational response to the compassionate person. He said, but I was just so tired, and I wanted somebody else to do it for once. But I sucked it up, and there I went, and the whole way over there, I'm complaining to God about the inconvenience of leaving my friends and the things that I want to do to go help this person that is a grown man and should be able to help himself and all the things that go on to that piece of it, you know? And he gets there, and he says, oh, the smell of vomit just hits you the moment you walk in the door. And so he knows you're going to have to clean that up. There's another layer of bad things, you know? Oh, I hate this so much. So he's... You know, trying to settle, you know, Jimmy over here, and he's trying to clean up the mess. And in comes a roommate from downstairs. He smells a moment. He gets sick. So now he's got two grown men sick, and he's trying to clean up for both of them. And, oh, he is, I mean, just inside, he's just human. You've been there, right? Oh, my. Whoa. Why? Why did I answer my phone? Why is this happening to me? You see, when suddenly the roommate burst out, I understand. I get it. <laughs> what, what, what do you get? What is it that you understand? He said, I finally understand who Jesus is. You've been trying to tell me this whole time, and I couldn't quite get it. But I finally get it. It's people like you. It's people like you taking care of me when I'm sick, when you don't really want to, when you don't have time, when you don't have energy. When you don't want to be there, it's loving me when you don't have to. <coughs> Can you imagine how he felt after that conversation? <clears throat> we talk about the word salty, right? It means something different today than the good things that I've been listing, right? What's the meaning of a person is salty? You know? Upset. Nasty. Yeah, upset. Nasty. Uh, annoyed. Oh, she is salty. <sighs> yeah, that's, that's, that's the kind of term. That's how we use it today. Um, and to be fair, that's kind of what the church has been seeing by the world. Right? Annoyed with the world. Annoyed with things. Upset when things don't go the way that we plan them. People don't look the way we look, worship the way we worship, sit the way we sit, believe the way we believe, post what we would think we should post. We are pretty salty with them, right? But that is not the salty Jesus is calling his disciples to be in this text. So I would pr propose, in the same way that Jesus likes to turn things upside down and make you think differently, that for us, we kind of think of salty in a different way. That we change it so that it looks different, sounds different, the whole nine yards. Well, maybe not sound different, but looks different. Let's get rid of the Y on the end of it, right? That, that's something we can do. It's going to look different, right? We get rid of that Y and put an E instead. Now we're going to change it. We're going to adjust it back to the meaning that Jesus had intended from the get-go. So that, that Y is now an E instead. But what does the E stand for? I mean, we got to come up with something for that, right? It can't just be, okay, we're just going to change this, and it's going to mean, I can think of a few things E could stand for. Okay. Eternal. Everlasting. I want to take it a little step further. Electrifying. That we, instead of being annoyed with the world, could instead be electrified by Christ. That we could be fueled by his everlasting love for those around us. So I say to us this morning, let us move beyond salty with a Y to being salty with an E. Amen. <laughs>